much, Brad. It is a real joy for me to welcome Mathieu Ricard here. Um, Mathieu, as you know, is a Buddhist monk, a um, philosopher, a scientist, a photographer, an author, and most recently the author of this amazing book, Altruism, The Power of Compassion to Change Yourself and the World, which has 1,600 scientific references in the back. So this is truly a combination of uh, all his many lives on this earth and uh, his incredible background. I must say on a personal note that I've been very blessed to have spent some time with Mathieu in very many different locations in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum, in Yellowstone where we went at a little conference and he took me on a fantastic mountain walk culminating in a meditation with our eyes open. Um, and then in Dharamsala where His Holiness the Dalai Lama lives and uh, Mathieu has been his official French translator for many years now. So wherever Mathieu is, there is incredible sense of peace and strength that he radiates. And it's always a real blessing to be in his presence. So Mathieu, let me first of all welcome you here and, you. Uh, and ask you about this book. Because the way you present altruism is dramatically different from how we think about it, which is in terms of sacrifice, often in terms of pity. And you are saying that, in fact, altruism starts with our own sense of inner strength. Mm -hmm. And that when we express altruism, it's both a shortcut to our own happiness and a shortcut to solving some of the major challenges in the world. Well, well said. <laughs> Thank you, Ariana. So I think you can take it on the two level, you know, a personal level and a more global aspect. So to begin with the personal level, as you said, you know, the idea that to be altruistic, you have to, to suffer. Otherwise, it's not really altruistic. That's so silly. You know, if you have an immense joy to do, accomplish the good of others, you know, you, this is the twofold accomplishment of others' good and your own. And if you look at the opposite, why the pursuit of selfish happiness does not work, it's dysfunction. Because first of all, if you only polarize about yourself, everything becomes an instrument for your well-being or a threat to your well-being, and then it's me, me, me all day long. You know, it's not a very happy state of mind, and then usually you'll be considered as a quite difficult person to be with. On top of that, it's dysfunctional. Why? because you assume that you could do that as a small separate unit while we are essentially interdependent. No altruistic love, compassion, benevolence. First of all, it's, it's meant to benefit others, but it's also the most gratifying mental state. It's a win-win situation. In addition to that, it's functional because you, know, you realize, I don't want to suffer. He, you don't want to suffer. He doesn't want to suffer. So it recognizes our common humanity and interdependence. So it's bound to work. So if you take it to the global level now, why you said it's maybe not the way we expect altruism to be seen, we usually see it as a kind of noble utopia, some kind of luxury we can afford if everything goes well. It appears to me, after meeting all these great thinkers, economists, scientists, social workers, neuroscientists, it is the only concept that can help us to reconcile the needs for the short term, like the economy, the mid term, the quality of life, how we thrive, how we flourish in 10 years, 20 years, and the needs of future generations. Why? Because it's very hard for economists to speak with environmentalists. They don't speak on the same time scale. When someone tells you, there's really a tipping point, a great danger. You will lose 30% of all species on Earth by 2050. Economists say, yes, but my preoccupation is the end of the year balance sheet. So there's a schizophrenic dialogue. Not that they are ever, their people are bad. Simply they don't find a way to have this common platform to work for a better world. And this simple notion of having more consideration for others. 
sort of reconcile those three time scales. You will have a more caring economics. You will remedy to inequalities and allow people to thrive in society. And you will have consideration for the future generation. So it becomes a working platform to build together a better world. And what is fascinating is that we think of giving to others as something that is exhausting. You know, you, you hear from a lot of people who do amazing work, whether it's in hospices or orphanages, you know, work that requires being exposed to human suffering all the time, and they talk about how incredibly emotionally draining it is. And you're saying that, in fact, authentic altruism is like a self-renewing resource. Yes. Uh, tell us about it, because that's very much a contradiction from what a lot of very sure. altruistic people have been telling us for years. So first of all, myself, you know, I've been involved now 15 years in humanitarian works. We have our, our foundation, Karuna Sechen. Now we have accomplished uh, 140 projects over many years. We work on the schools and hospitals uh, in India, Tibet, and Nepal. And we can see people who have this kind of burnout, social workers, you know, there's too much suffering. You see that in the medical world, 60% of all medical personnel in the United States have uh, or will suffer from burnout, that is emotional exhaustion, empathic distress. But what it's, you know, people speak of compassion fatigue. So the research we did with Tanya Singer, which is a neuroscientist who works on empathy, is that in fact, it's only due because you, if you only have empathy, it means resonating with the suffering of others, suffering because of their suffering, that's all you have at your disposal, you will burn out. Like an electric pump without water, it burns. So what is the antidote? Loving kindness, benevolence. And we could show that in the brain, if you engage in altruistic love and loving kindness meditation, it neutralizes the empathic distress and the fact that you, you feel the suffering of others by the impact it has on you. But what you need is to develop the courage of compassion, other-oriented. And the more suffering, the more determination, the more en to enthusiasm to remedy to that suffering. Well, if it's by the impact it has on you, self-oriented, the more suffering, the more you are overwhelmed. So in fact, Altruistic love is the antidote to burnout. And we could show that in the brain, it's different networks in the brain. We could show that by training people. If they only do empathy, they see suffering everywhere, they get sort of depressed. If they meditate on loving kindness, they, they embrace suffering with a much more constructive way. And you know, you have lived in Nepal, you have lived in India, you have lived among an enormous amount of suffering. So you are actually practicing what you are preaching. And the meditation that you teach, you know, the traditional Buddhist meditation of starting with uh, extending compassion and love to someone very close to you that you love, and then going beyond that to the whole world. Would you walk us through a meditation for compassion and altruism yes. right now? Sure. Well, you see, for instance, if you want to learn how to sail a boat, you will start with the fine weather. You are not going to start when this very stormy day, you know, with, a, with a storm that will not work. So in the same way, before thinking how you could extend compassion to strangers or to even worse, to someone who has been harming you or to someone who is an enemy of humanity, let's start with something more natural, and then we can see how to extend it. So the idea is to bring to mind someone for whom it is very natural, spontaneous. You have no any hesitation to give your full benevolence. You could see, you know, a beautiful young child, someone you love in life, a companion, a parent, even a little animal, you know, and then wish, may that child be happy, be safe, having nothing but good thoughts, beneficial thoughts to that person. So usually we do experience that in our life, but it doesn't last. I mean, we move to something else. Instead of moving to something else, the only difference with meditation is you will nurture that, cultivate that for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. That means 
you will fill your mind with that state of benevolence. Then when it declines, you revive it. And when you're distracted, you come back to it. So it's simply that we don't do that usually. We do that with physical exercise. We do that when we learn a musical instrument. But we don't do that with those fundamental human qualities like loving kindness. So why not? Because this is the only way that taking, starting from our baseline to bring our level of altruism to its optimal according to our own capacities. But if we leave it like that, it will always be at the minimal sort of state. And you write in the book something that is particularly dear to our heart here at the Huffington Post because we launched a, a global editorial initiative that we are calling What's Working?, and we want to put a spotlight on good things happening around yes. the world. And, and you're right. You say that because of evolution, we have been equipped to focus on danger and drama. We have this overwhelming feeling of how wicked the world is. And in fact, the banality of goodness is overlooked. Yes. You know, we overlook the fact that there are incredible expressions of compassion, of altruism, of ingenuity, of solutions, and we kind of overlook them. And the media, certainly those of us in the media, are not doing a good job of putting the spotlight on all the good things happening. So as a result, this reinforces our view that the world is basically going to hell in a handbasket. Well, you know, occasionally there is an editorial about a wonderful NGO doing some fantastic works, or the unsung heroes of compassion. But, you know, this is not breaking news. Breaking news usually is a bomb went there somewhere and 25 people died. That's usually the breaking news. 100 people who go somewhere uh, or even within New York, take care of the homeless, take care of elderly. You know, of course, people may speak about that, but again, it's not hot news. But if one of those persons goes and rob a bank or attack an old lady in the street, you will have your hour of glory because that's, wow, somebody you know, did that. So that's a bit of a distortion because we sort of oversee this banality of good and goodness, even though it is much more present in our life as those exceptional things. You know, what a distortion to think that a 12 years old, 12 year old in North America and Europe, has seen 10,000 violent deaths on TV and film. What does that have to do with reality for a 10 years old? So it's a real a distortion. So it, gives, it, it paints a very dark picture of human nature, but it is not the reality. So, and we know that if you tell to a child when he has done something nice to other, oh, you are such a good person, you have a good heart, that really boosts that quality. If you say, oh, you are such a wicked child, he will have a tendency to act in such a way that has been shown, that has been studied. So to give a sense of confidence in the potential that we have to feel and express benevolence is a very important uh, I, a notion and we need to give hope that we have this potential. And in fact, you are very optimistic in the book about the perfectibility of humanity. You, you say that globally violence rates are falling and signs of grassroots solidarity are everywhere. There is something in the air. Um, we definitely try to capture this, uh, but it goes very much against the grain of what we see leading the news. So what can we do, you think, to contribute to accelerating that something that's in the air? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, good journalism, uh, good science, uh, good education should be to be closer to reality. So when we ask people, and Steven Pinker, when he wrote his book on the decline of violence, which on which I base a chapter, you know, he made an opinion poll online about his readers. Uh, do you think that we are living more, we have, you know, just in ordinary life, uh, about being murdered or killed in the year, it's more dangerous today than 300 years ago? You know, and about 30, 40% of people think it's, it's more dangerous now. It's 100 times less risky to be killed. I mean, especially in Europe, the, the homicide rates have gone basically from 100 uh, homicides per 100,000 per year to one. 
average. In Japan, it's zero, zero, 006. You know, so basically, you never been such a safe environment. You know, we know here, for some reason that you know very well, it's still 10, which is a very high number. It's basically because in countries like France, Japan, or, or England, there's no way you can buy, uh, keep a, a gun at home. You know, it's just, if you do have so, you may have to up to 10 years of jail. So there's no mystery why in Japan the rate of homicide is 0, 0, 0.6. But still, compared to before, you know, in California during the gold rush, you had a rate of homicide of 400 per year per 100,000 inhabitants. So it has gone down. Violence against children, abuse of all kinds, have diminished by half in the United States over 20 years. So those are very encouraging factors. So I think to, to make that known is just encouraging. You know, and that's really, you, know, you have to be optimistic, not in a naive way, but to give confidence that we can go further, increase the level of cooperation, work together, you know, the good people team together and achieve not only individually to become more altruistic, but to shift to a more cooperative culture. So, unfortunately, we only have four minutes left before we open it up to questions. So, I want to take you back to another book you wrote, which is a book I absolutely love, um, The Monk and the Philosopher, which is the book you wrote with your father. It's just such an amazing story, you know, your father being this great intellectual, this great philosopher, and suddenly his son... Uh, who was also a great intellectual, a scientist, a molecular geneticist, becomes a monk. You can imagine what that must have been like. And, and yet, you came together and, and you wrote this book, um, which is really, as the subtitle puts it, a father and a son discuss the meaning of life. So, did you and your father come to some agreement about the meaning of life by the end of it? I think what my father was uh, trying to see is what happens today to the three main questions that the Greek philosophers were asking themselves. What can I know? How to govern the city or the state? And how to lead my life? And he said, you know, how to govern the state? Basically, democracy is, is the best system. <laughs> And then, what do I know? Science has taken a great deal to uh, inform us about the reality of the world. But how do I lead my life? He felt that the philosopher has given up that task since Spinoza or whatever. And because now they're just making big systems that no one understands and it doesn't help you to have a good life. So he felt that, at least we have fundamentally agreed, that Buddhism became more popular, you know, in France it's considered to be the third most popular form of spirituality, 10%. It's quite a lot for a traditionally absolutely not Buddhist country. And he thought because it offers an art of life, you know, day to day, moment after moment, how to deal with your emotions, with your thoughts, to strive to become a better human being for yourself, for society. And that was sort of filling a gap. And so besides that, you know, of course, on the more metaphysical level, we didn't agree on some of the views of Buddhism, but we had a strong sort of uh, meeting of minds in the idea that uh, something that was a very empirical approach of happiness and suffering, of how to lead one's life, was relevant to our modern times. And possibly in a secular way, what the Dalai Lama called secular ethics, you know, compassion, of course, all religions have promoted compassion and love of the other, unless they deviated into, unfortunately, uh, you know, hate and oppression. But, but to say that compassion and love has to be linked with the religion excludes half of humanity who doesn't anymore lead their life according to religion. It's more fundamental than religion. It's a basic need to give and receive love from birth to death. So this is something that concerns every single sentient being. So that's why when we say secular ethics is not against religion, but even more fundamental. And I think altruism is more fundamental. It, it concerns every single human being. And I'd like to end my part by, by saying that one of the most fascinating aspects of what you're doing is the way you have embraced science. And uh, in fact, you have collaborated with many great scientists to understand the brain, to understand the neuroplasticity of the brain, 
Uh, you have been uh, a guinea pig yourself, um, so that you know the the moniker, the happiest man on the world, in the world, comes out of a um, scientific experiment that Professor Richard Davidson. Con well, the, the, no, it's come mostly from wonderful journalists, but it has no scientific basis. So how can you know how <laughs> it's the happiest among seven billion beings? It's no, a nice the, joke, but it's a nice the, one. But the, the scientific experiment had to do with the fact of putting 250 sensors on your brain, and as Richard Davidson explained, seeing unprecedented levels of gamma waves, which are predisposing human beings to happiness and to positive thoughts and feelings. So that became encapsulated in that term, the happiest term, but the scientific reality behind it is that you can actually create more gamma waves in your brain. That is a very significant fact because for many decades, indeed centuries, who thought that the brain was fixed. Yes. And now we are discovering that in fact you can affect your brain. You can affect, as you have said, your capacity for happiness. Yes. And that in fact, giving and altruism are shortcuts to happiness. And one other thing that I, I absolutely love about what you've written and taught is that everything you're saying is not, as you've said, for the person chilling out under a mango tree, but for the person in the arena, you know, who is leading their lives fully, um, who is achieving, who is facing challenges, and everything that you teach is really an incredible arsenal of um, ways to live in this world, as your father would have said, in a way that encompasses the best that philosophy and spiritual uh, teachings have to bring. So we're very grateful that you have chosen this path. And um, we now want to open it up to anybody who has a question. And if you can tell us who you are and what you do here, that would be helpful. Yes. I think, thank you. I think uh, of course, it's wonderful if one, uh, when one does that and compassion and love, and uh, it's wonderful. But, um, you know, I've heard uh, that everyone has heaven and hell within them, and if we can, of course, manifest the compassion and the love, it's quite wonderful, but uh, certainly everyone knows ISIS and, and all Al-Qaeda and all the stuff in the Middle East, chopping off heads, but even in this country, I mean, my feeling is that, in general, the right-wing Republicans are almost without compassion. They care only about money or about their position or everything else. So how do you deal? I mean, yes, when it's easy, that's fine. But how do you deal when all around you, you know, there are these people almost, I would say, they're not totally without compassion, but they're, I would say, they're sort of brainwashed. And they're, if they live, they wouldn't, if they listened to you, would be in one ear and out the other. Okay, that's the end of my question. Well, nobody is born and with uh, kind of right away thinking how to I chop people's head. Nobody is born with the idea that I just only purpose in life, you know, when you are four years old is to make money and nothing else. So they are conditioning, as you said. And then, you know, it's like when you work in the health uh, you know, we do a lot of programming on health. It's so much better to work on prevention than when uh, things go wrong. And it was an epidemic. And of course, sometimes when you say, what do you do about ISIS with altruism and compassion? Well, it's like asking, you know, the forest is in fire. You know, what about this prevention stuff? It's useless. So, but this didn't happen for no reason. And so in that case, you know, compassion is not about moral judgment. Moral judgment, of course, is there. But compassion looks, what are the causes of suffering? How can we remedy to that? Whatever shape they take, whatever it is, like a skillful physician, even as a very mad, violent person in front of him, he will momentarily prevent that person from harming. That's the first need. But then he is not going to take a, a, big, a big stick and beat the person down to death. 
is going to see is there a way somehow to cure that person or not, or at least to prevent other person to become like that. That's compassion. It's not being sort of weak. It's not tolerating this barbaric violence. But it's just trying to see the global picture. First, how, can we cure those people? Or can we prevent others to become like that? So that has to see a much more long-term picture, change of culture. You know, how does that happen? First, you need a critical mass of people whose ideas become appealing. 10% of people, or a few people decided in England in the 18th century, slavery should be abolished. Everybody laughed. They said the British Empire will economically collapse without, uh, you know, without slavery. It's impossible. Then 10 years later, it was done. Nobody says, no, it was not so bad. You know, it was nice economically. It makes sense. It, no, we cannot go back on this. So those cultural changes you know, happen. And that is the good thing which I found when researching that book, is how to go from you know, individual change. You have a number of people who change their ideas. This is not OK, ethically, morally. And then that sort of create a tipping point in the change of culture. And evolution of culture is a wonderful, interesting branch of evolution. It's faster than genes, fortunately. And so we have to see this global picture and how those two articulate with each other and see the long term, see the, you know, any genocide started with a thought of hate. It started with precursor signs that we have ignored. And then when everything goes bad, we say, what to do? Just send the army, bomb them. Okay, but you know, if we take care of the disease, when it's just beginning, then something could be done much more easier. I mean, yes. Hi, Diane Brady, a journalist. I'm curious, I want to pivot off your point of cultural change. Um, can a brand or a company be altruistic? How do you measure it? Do you measure it by outcome? Since you're talking obviously about individuals, but we see here so much now about social responsibility. Yes. How does this work at the community level, institution? So, you know, the company like Unilever in, in, in Holland, uh, Netherlands, they have put the, that everyone should be happy to work there. They should have a strong uh, pro-social component from the, from the CEO to the employees. They give them free time to work, uh, paid work, paid time to devote them some time to a social cause. There are quite a few of that. And then you can also have studies that shows that the place where you're happy to work usually prosper better. Uh, and so that is a clear indication. Why are you, are you happy to work somewhere? Because there is mutual trust. Because there's more cooperation than competition within the, the, the corporation. That somehow people share information. They work as a team. That's what makes a happy place to work. You know? So then... Why don't we favor that? Because it's good for everybody. It's good for the people who work. So I see more leadership as a way of serving, serving the purpose of the corporation, serving the people with, with, with whom you work, and if possible, serving society at large. And it seems that in time of crisis, corporation, we have embedded a social component, fare better because there's more meaning to continue rather than going somewhere else if it's only the profit that motivates you. Hello, Matthew. Uh, my name is uh, James, and uh, I was curious how you felt when you found out that you were considered the happiest man on earth. Well, it's a kind of a joke, but you know, <laughs> after all, you know, I, I wrote disclaimers on my blog. Of course, nobody reads that, so they, so I, you know, it was so funny because I got calls at midnight from the BBC, you know, news hours. We want to have you live right now. I said, "What's going on?" You know, did, did I won Nobel Prize or something? <laughs> so then they say. Oh, so I told them, you know, I have no clue why the people, everybody wrote that once in the first place. Anyone can be the happiest woman or man in the world if you look for happiness in the right place. You know, it has basically no scientific basis except that they found that when we engage in compassion meditation, not only me, but any of the long-term meditators who did that, the strong activation, as Ariane has said, you know, in, in gamma frequency, there's an intensity that was never reported before in neuroscience, but that doesn't make you the unhappiest person in the world. So this story comes back again and again. And one of my good friends, one of my Tibetan teachers, said, well, no, just give it up, this idea of wanting to say no, no, no. Just play with that. You know, use it for good purpose. You know, use it for um, motivating people to help for your humanitarian projects. So, 
Anyway, it's better than be called the unhappiest person in the world, so I have to live with it. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Bradley. <clears throat> this question is from Periscope. Um, with uh, social media, thing, Twitter, Facebook, Periscope, things like that, when it comes to uh, having this better view of people from around the world and meeting people from around the world and learning about different cultures and everything like that, do you feel that's something that's helped with this and helped to make this a, a better situation? You know, there are tools, and any tool can be used to harm or to do good. Even intelligence. Intelligence by itself, you know, 9 11 people were so smart to do all that with a few razor blades and planning. They were intelligent, but it's completely missing the altru altruistic component. So, likewise, social media can be a window for narcissism. They can be used to do cyberbullying, but they can also be, do, be used to do crowdfunding, uh, to work uh, for a social cause, you know, the, the, the Arab Spring, or, or even Facebook, you know, they raised uh, $16 million for the earthquake in Nepal. From our own side, we also raised a significant amount. We now have been be able to help 70,000 uh, people in, in 200 villages. Each of them got 15 days of food ration. We took care of their medical needs and shelter. Mostly that was achieved through social media, the internet, and people sending us donations to accomplish this work. So again, it all depends on your motivation. The motivation is what gives value to the tool. A hammer can be used to build a house or to destroy the house. It all depends what is your motivation. Unfortunately, we have to take our last question. So, yes. Uh, what role do you see the arts, things like music, taking in this, this motivation of this altruism? What to say? <laughs> I mean, arts usually <laughs> uh, supposedly to bring some kind of sense of harmony uh, in, within your heart and mind, among with others. Uh, so a sense of beauty is not only outer beauty, but also inner beauty somehow. I know with photography, you know, when I photograph a spiritual master, he maybe have lost all his teeth, but the, the kind of goodness and wisdom that that person radiates from within you know, if I can convey that to the heart of photography, I feel it's a good service to humanity. If you can show images of tragedy, as war correspondents sometimes do, it brings people to decide that we should put an end to that. So, of course, again, you know, art is one of the most noble forms of expression of human creativity. And it all depends, you know, again, if it's just to boost your super ego or if it's just to share happiness with others. You know, again, everything can be used depending on your motivation to harm or to do good. So, Mathieu, uh, thank you so much for giving us the time to be with us. Thank you for all the incredible work you're doing and for really bringing together um, scientific wisdom with the ancient wisdom and recognizing that the teachings of the philosophers about what is a good life and the teachings of um, Buddhists around uh, ignorance being suffering um, are really now being validated by modern scientific findings. So there's no division between the two. And you're in this unique position to, to bring that to the world because of your scientific and your spiritual background. So... Um, we want to continue our relationship, have um, excerpts from the book uh, regularly published on the Huffington Post, um, have a conversation going around these themes, the way we started the conversation here today, because as you said, every time we delve into these topics, we actually cultivate that part of ourselves, the way we learn to play tennis or sailing or anything else, it doesn't happen overnight. So we want to give it the time and the energy to build those altruistic muscles that, as you say so 
convincingly in the book will transform both our lives and the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.